Bounty hunters. We don't need that scum. Yes, sir. Those rebels won't escape us. Sir, we have a priority signal from the Star Destroyer Avenger. Right. There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. You are free to use any methods necessary, but I want them alive. No disintegration. As you wish. Greetings, Bucketheads. Mevar Tigar. Happy Life Day! Welcome to a special bonus episode of Mandovision, Nargai Tom. And thank you so much for checking out this small, independent Star Wars podcast. We call it Mandovision. Welcome. Remember, the best way to follow, to uh, to reach out and, and, and uh, be in touch with the show is at social media. We are at Mando underscore Vision on Twitter and Instagram. We are on all your favorite podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and a couple others. You know, there's plenty more in the mix. Um, but hey, those are the big ones, right? And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please do us a big favor. Give us those sweet, sweet, sweet five set reviews. They go a long way to helping small podcasts like us not get lost in the deep reaches of hyperspace without our nav computers working. Uh, we need those. They change the algorithm, they get more eyeballs on our show, and that's that's the best thing you can do to help this podcast out, and I appreciate it so very, very much. Remember, we are a proud part of the 3 Busy Network of Podcasts that includes such fine shows as Beer Night in San Diego, the TomCast Popcast, a more widespread pop culture podcast that I, I uh, host with, a, with a, uh, a, a wide array of guests and friends as co-hosts, and of course, this podcast, Mandivision, very Star Wars-centric, very focused on the Mandalorian, and all good things Star Wars. We also have a sweet uh, store envy page that you can check out too, where you can get all kinds of stuff with my face on it. Because hey, what kind of life day party is it if you're not wearing a shirt with my face on it? All right, listen, let's get into the episode. Remember, this is going to be a bonus episode, so it's going to be fairly short, fairly concise. Well, you, if if you listen to the podcast before, you know concise is probably not one of my strong points. We might ramble just a tiny, tiny bit, but thank you all so much for checking this out. I'm going to list this as a bonus episode because we did anticipate this this very thing at the tail end of last week's episode after concluding season two. So, what are we here to talk about today? This is going to be a Bantha Tracks episode, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about. Um, well, hold on, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we talk about what we're going to talk about. We have to do something. We have to strap on our buckets. Let's go. Now I can tell you what we're here to talk about. Again, special bonus Bantha Tracks episode of the show. Today was the day, as we sort of speculated last week, the book of Boba Fett officially announced as a series starring Tamora Morrison as Boba Fett and Ming-Na Wen returning as Fennec Shand. And it will begin streaming on Disney Plus in December of 2021. And most importantly, it will be a separate series from the Mandalorian. So the adventures of Din Djarin are not over. Not yet. Uh, and I think that's exciting. I think that's good. I know there was a lot of speculation. Did we see the end of, of Din's journey? Had he, you know, after completing his task of delivering little Grogu to a Jedi, was was that the end of Finn's journey? And, you know, we left him in a, in a, in a, in a interesting position. So it's good to know that we are going to get the the we're going to get to get to pick up the pick up Finn's or Finn's we're going to get to pick up Din's trail uh you know in season 3 of the Mandalorian officially like this won't be some sort of diversionary season where like oh it's season 3 of the Mandalorian but it's actually this Boba Fett show and then we don't go back to Din until season 4 or season 5 or whatever no 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 these are going to be shows that are on roughly the same time it's still a little unclear uh it's definitely sounds like we won't get season 3 of of the Mandalorian until 2022, but it is possible that Disney will will do both these series concurrently, and that would be in December of 2021 of the, of the year just around the corner from us right now. Which, hey, why not? I mean, we just talked about all those shows that Disney just just announced, all that Star Wars content that's coming to Disney Plus. 
so why not add a little bit more? So, you know, there's going to be some overlap with those shows that you would imagine at some point. You know, if you're going to keep creating that much Star Wars content, uh, there's, there's a good chance that you're just going to kind of feed into each other. And that's a good thing, especially when you have announced other shows that are in this timeline. And that's probably the other, the other piece of important information about the Boba Fett series. It is indeed set during the timeline of The Mandalorian. So what we saw as that post credit scene probably happens right after, or shortly thereafter, the events of the season two finale. Now, in case you're you're wondering, yeah, we're probably going to get into spoilers. I think you all know that's kind of the rule by now. Uh, you know, we just talk about it. We talk about everything. And, and to do so, to have a frank, earnest, honest conversation, we have to talk about all the things. There, we cannot keep secrets from each other. We all know what happened. If you haven't watched the show, you got to go back and watch it. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. That's just how it is. So as we speculated in last week's Season 2 finale episode, uh, this is a really interesting notion, this Book of Boba Fett series, uh, mostly because of where it sort of puts us with Fett taking over the leadership role of, of, of the Hutt Syndicate, uh, of, of Jabba's empire. Uh, he easily dispatches uh, Bib Fortuna. We talked about a little bit about, we speculated a little bit, that it certainly seems like Bib Fortuna was not doing a great job of running Jabba's affairs, of, of sort of, you know, keeping Jabba the Hutt's uh, interests and in, in income levels flowing the way that Jabba had them before. You know, the palace was run down. It wasn't... The, the, the sort of hive of scum, of scum and villainy that we saw it to be in Return of the Jedi it wasn't bustling with, with all kinds of activity and, 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 you know, just crazy beings, hangers-on, you know, and, and, and people vying for Jabba's uh, attention and Jabba's, uh, uh, you know, good graces, I suppose. Uh, and and, and our, our view of Tatooine, our view of Mos Eisley in The Mandalorian would seem to reflect that, that since Jabba has been gone... The, the the planet has become a remote backwater world again. There's there's not the you know Mos Eisley's not the bustling spaceport that it was when when we saw it previously, in in the original trilogy, when we saw it in A New Hope, or when we went even when we went back to Tatooine, for the Mandalorian episodes, you you see the difference between the two, and even going back to the to the prequel series. I mean, uh, you know, we don't go to Mos Eisley, but we're in Mos Espa, which is another bustling spaceport. Jabba's there. Jabba's exerting control and influence. So Jabba brings a lot of people to the planet for to help conduct his affairs. You know, whether it's... Uh, obviously, there's a lot of criminality going on. Smuggling, uh, uh, contraband, all, all that sort of stuff that Jabba's into. And, and uh, you know, possibly for the first time, we're going we're gonna to get to kind of chronicle that a little bit better. You know, what were some of the things that Jabba the Hutt was into as far as his, his criminal enterprises go? You know, obviously, he employed Han Solo. Han Solo was a smuggler. So we know there's some smuggling going on. Spice and things of that nature, but there's a lot. There's a lot of ground to get into. It's, it, kind of exploring this this criminal underbelly of the Star Wars galaxy uh, should be a lot of fun, and to be able to do it with Boba Fett uh, makes a ton of sense. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something. If if you watched the Clone Wars cartoon, remember those the, there were plenty of episodes with Boba, and this was kind of the path he was on to begin with. I mean, he wasn't just gonna be a bounty hunter. He kind of had. I don't know if grand designs on, on taking over Jabba's empire was ever really in the cards for him initially. Uh, but he wasn't... He never seemed like a character who was content to, to simply be one thing. And I think he sees an opportunity. Obviously, he's been on Tatooine for quite some time. And hopefully that's something we get to explore. It's like, what's happened to Boba after Return of the Jedi? How long was he in the Sarlacc pit? Is, is his escape fairly recent? Uh... You know, it takes a thousand years to digest in the Sarlacc pit. So how much time did he spend in there? When he came out, was he surprised at the things he saw? Was he surprised to see that Bib Fortuna had wasted this opportunity to, to step in and, and run Jabba's affairs and, and to be the sort of space gangster that Jabba was? Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, obviously we can tell Boba's got some scar, a, bit of a, a bit of a scarred visage. You know, those, those uh, Sarlacc digestive acids, you know, probably did a little work on him. But again, it's curious, like, I, I would imagine that'll be one of the things that we have to see in this in this series, is the escape from the Sarlacc pit. Will it be similar to the things that we, we've read in the old Expanded Universe stuff? 
you know, uh, he says the line in, in the Dark Horse comic book, uh, Dark Empire, when, when Han Solo first encounters him again for the first time since Return of the Jedi, and he, he tells Han that the Sarlacc found him somewhat indigestible. And then uh, the, some short stories, I believe it's Tales from, the, uh, Tales from Jabba's Palace, is, is one of the short stories where uh, what happens to Boba inside the Sarlacc, Sarlacc pit is, is, is told, and how he sort of is able to blast his way out of there. Now, remember, too, what we've seen on The Mandalorian. Remember, that's old stuff. That doesn't count anymore. Will that be reincorporated into the lore? Well, there's been a, a fair amount of reincorporation of, of old lore into the new canon. But maybe they go a different route. Things are going to be a little different, for sure, because remember, at some point, excuse me, Cobb Vanth gets his hold on the armor. How does that come to be? How do the Jawas find the armor? Is it just there in the desert by itself, and the Jawas pick it up? Or is there is there a story about how Boba had to lose the armor for a time for a, a, a moment in time? Did, what occurred? What how that happened? How that play out? It will be interesting to get into those, and I would imagine that will be something that is covered at some point during the book of Boba Fett. I mean, after all, it's a book, right? So there should be a beginning, a middle, and an end. Which one are we gonna get first? It wouldn't surprise me to see us get a Star Wars. It wouldn't be. It'd be kind of fun to get a Star Wars story kind of told out of chronological order, wouldn't it? That might be an interesting take on the show. Uh, but who knows? It could just be told in flashbacks, and and uh, you know, Boba Fett thinking of something, and then we we cue back to what was going on in the past. What what you know? So he sees something. That tri- you know what I'm saying? He sees something that triggers him, and then we go and explore that bit of uh, information how it triggered him and why it relates to what he's seen in the present by exploring what he's, what happened to him in the past, that sort of situation. Uh, it, it, it's going to be an interesting show. I'm really pleased that Ming-Na Wen will be coming back to be part of this show as Fennec Shand. Uh, it was a character I thought had a lot of potential to begin with. And I think we saw, I think we got a good taste of that in this new season in particular, in season two. She was really, really strong character, fun to watch. And whipped so much butt, whipped so much booty in that in that finale episode where just just so many, so many stormtroopers hit the ground from from Ming Na Wen and, and as Finnick in that episode. Really strong, strong stuff. But we don't know anything. But it's fun to speculate, isn't it? But yeah, we have no official facts on what the storyline will be, what's going to take place other than, hey, this is going to take place in the timeline of the Mandalorian. And I think that's really great news. It, it leads for a lot of uh, fun continuations with with characters that maybe we've we've run across before. Maybe it'll go in some new directions. We we'll get some obviously get some new characters, but it might be fun again. You know, we're we're gonna explore the criminal underworld. It would be sort of interesting to see Boba Fett taking on the role of the person who hires the bounty hunters now, as opposed to being one of the hired guns of, of a gangster. You know, does that mean we bring back Dengar? We bring back Forlom. We bring back Zuckus. You know, do we get to explore the IG robots? Do we get to know more about them as, as opposed to sort of like the whispers that we have in, in some of the old and some of the new canon on, on what their deal is? You know, will there be a new IG unit in this series, perhaps? Do we find out that IG-88's fate wasn't what it was in the old canon where uh, where Boba blows him up over the over the over, in orbit of Tatooine as he's attempting to deliver Han to Jabba the Hutt? I don't know. There again, a lot of potential, a lot of interesting ideas uh, on, on where to go, and I think the show is going to be a ton of fun. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm sure Tamara Morrison is is up for the task. But Boba Fett is often a character who who um, you know not much of a talker necessarily. <laughs> so I think uh, you know he, he's often like the strong silent type. He only speaks when he needs to. You know, uh, uh, which I think is why it's important to have Fennec as his right-hand person in this episode, uh, because A, Ming Na Wen is awesome, and, and more of her on the on the show can only be a good thing, uh, but, it, but it allows Boba Fett to still be somewhat mysterious, you know, somewhat uh, 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 unknown in the show, especially if he, if he, if he just sits there on that throne in his armor, and you don't know what he's saying, what or what he's thinking, because you can't read his face, I mean, there's there's a lot. The, Tamora Morrison's gonna have a chance to do a lot of stuff with this character, but I don't know. It's just gonna be interesting. I, it, again, it's hard to speculate right now. 
Uh, the other big bit of news that we should mention for this series is that joining Johnny Favs, a.k.a. John Favreau, and Dave Filoni as executive producers on the show will be Robert Rodriguez, uh, who helped direct the episode The Tragedy. No, I shouldn't say helped direct. He did direct the episode The Tragedy, uh, which was the one that brought Boba Fett back in his armor. And we got a, a, a really great action-packed episode, a really strong action episode with Boba just kind of wrecking house and we, we get to sort of see him as as the the badass that we've always believed him to be so really great stuff really really good um more of that please i think having robert rodriguez join the fold on that is only going to be a good thing the other thing we should talk about real quick uh before we wrap up like i said this is going to be a short little bonus episode so no, so and you know we're just playing speculation theater right now which again is a lot of fun but we you know we have zero information to go on so we have to wonder, what's next for Din Djarin? We know the shows are separate now. We know we will eventually catch back up with, with Din. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see where that character is, where his head's at, as far as, A, all the information that he learned about about himself, the group of Mandalorians he's with, the other Mandalorians that exist out there, uh, but also... Uh, how has his experiences with Grogu changed him for the long term? Uh, you know, will he revert back to sort of the cold, distant, you know, din that we saw in the first couple of episodes of the show? Uh, just a sort of a sort of like some kind of uh, like psychological uh, uh, defense mechanism. He reverts back into that cold, merciless character, or is he is he permanently changed uh, by by Grogu and and the emotions and and you know, his love for that child. Uh, if I were to guess, I'd say, I'd say it's the latter. It is that uh, we will see a change to Din Djarin, uh, particularly as it, as it relates to his perceptions of, of who he is and, and, and his role with the Mandalorians. Remember, we, we, we've left Din in a very, uh, a very dangerous position to be perfectly honest. Uh, he is in possession of the dark saber, the item that Bo-Katan wants more than anything. And now Din has it, and as established by Moff Gideon, uh, he, she must defeat him in combat to claim it. So is that where we're going to go with this? I suspect that this, the new season of The Mandalorian will begin to more fully explore the Mandalorians as a, as a culture, as a, as, a, as a people, and and we're going to start getting into, into the clans and into the different... Uh, creeds and belief systems we will probably get to explore the children of mandalore this group that apparently raised Din Djarin, their connection to death watch their connection to possibly bo katan's connection to death watch and how that might play into things but it's also going to be interesting to note uh, uh let, let's just put something out there i talked about it last week the bo katan character is is a fascinating character because uh she has a single-minded determinist a single-minded vision of of what she is supposed to do for her people and how she will do it. Whether she ends up being on the side of right or the side of wrong, that's inconsequential. So, what we what we should consider, she was in possession of the Darksaber when Star Wars Rebels ends. Now, we find her in the time of the Mandalorian, she has lost the Darksaber to Moff Gideon. Now, at the time, she was given the Darksaber, and that is something we will have to explore more, because... Because Sabine Wren did give it to her. There was no combat involved. But we, we talked about it last week too. We speculated. Is it because she lost it to Gideon that she must fight to get it back? Again, we, th those are things that we will get answers to. Don't, don't, don't worry your, heads, your pretty little heads about it yet. I'm sure they will explain it. Remember, in Favreau, in Filoni, we trust. They will give us the information that we need. But what's interesting to what, what I want to consider is we don't know the state of all the different Mandalorian clans, all the all the different sects uh, of of the Mandalorians. They 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 bought in, they supported Bo-Katan Kryze at one point when she was first bequeathed the, the the dark saber. But where do they stand with her now that she has lost it once? Will they rally to support her again, or is this just like a desperate plea on her part to to get back the leadership of Mandalore? But even if she gets the dark saber, will the other clans come back? It's a valid question. You know, and it may be that they won't go back to Bo-Katan, despite what she thinks. 
it would be interesting if they might rally more around Din Djarin as, as, as this person who has sort of, I don't know, just experienced so many new things and isn't bogged down by so much of Mandalore's history. So he presents a sort of brighter beacon than Bo-Katan. Or... We have the possibility. Does Bo Katan try to use Din Djarin as some sort of some sort of a puppet or like figurehead leader? No, I think everyone wouldn't really buy into that into that line of, of thought. I mean, Din's too smart of a well. I've questioned Din's intelligence a couple of times, so <laughs> I say this with a grain of salt. But I don't think he'd be easily manipulated by Bo Katan, and I don't think that she's necessarily the, the puppet master type character. That that was that's not really her jam. So we're gonna have a fun time. Exploring that, and again, this is wild speculation for season three of, of the Mandalorian. But I suspect this will be a, a big impetus: is is we're actually going to get to see the Mandalorians as a people, as a, as a culture, as a society, and and all the desperate factions that exist within it, and and how how Din Djarin might be the one to bring them all back together again. It's going to be a good fun time, and I think it's going to be. It's just going to be a blast, and uh, we should all be really excited about what the future holds for Star Wars. It's just going to take so gosh darn long to get the, these new these new uh, series out. That that's the only bummer is we just have to wait. But uh, hey, sometimes waiting waiting is worth it, right? I, I mean, listen, we waited we waited a whole year for season two of Mandalorian, and it paid off big time. This season was uh, to me a resounding success. Every episode bigger and better than the one before it. Just top notch entertainment. Again, I, I I talked about that emotional core. I've watched that episode, that finale, several more times, and I still cry like a little baby at all the same spots I cried before. And I'm not ashamed of that. I embrace it. I love it. I own it. But anyways, <laughs> we can't wait. We can't wait to see what's going to happen next. It's going to be so much fun. And I hope you all stick around and, and go on the journey with me as, as we continue to explore Mandalorian Season 3, and the Book of Boba Fett, and all the Star Wars content that's going to be coming our way in the near future. Now, I did to talk about it a little bit, but it is we will be back in January, and we will begin covering Star Wars The Clone Wars, going back through the epic history of that, of that series, which illuminates a lot of, of bits of pieces of information for our Mandalorian characters. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and it, you know, hey, since we have until December, we might even get to Rebels. Fingers crossed. We'll get to Rebels at some point before Boba Fett starts in December. Anyways, that's sort of the plan of action. I'll be off over the holidays. but We'll be back that first week of January to start covering the Star Wars, the Clone Wars, the movie. Uh, but if any, any if any news breaks before that or in the meantime, don't worry. We'll be back here to, to, to cover that and, and have another conversation. Uh, in the meantime, I hope everyone has a wonderful, safe, happy holiday season. If you are a Christmas person, uh Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, all of them. I hope everyone has a great time. If you celebrate Life Day, have a good one with that too. Watch out for the for the the Wookies. They get a little crazy on Life Day. But otherwise, remember, the best way to get a hold of this podcast is via social media. We are at TomCast underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, please give us your love and support, and we will be eternally grateful for that. In the meantime, keep doing all the things you're doing. Keep supporting the show. It means so much to me. And remember, this is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way.